fresh meat. <laughs> you ever thought about your life like it's a math equation? You get up, go to work, you get paid. Two plus two is four. You, I don't know, study, try not to get kicked out, you graduate. You buy her flowers, you take her to dinner. Maybe she'll be your girlfriend. We tend to think of things like this by putting the goal first, and then you kind of back into it, and you try to figure out what are the essential pieces of the equation that you need to get to the end. And then once you figure it out, you kind of lock it in. So for me, I'm in Sugarland. We write songs for country radio. We get the songs on the radio. We go out into the world and tour. Fans sing the songs back to us. We're famous. Works, right? We tend to count on the equation once we figure it out. And then spend time, once you get the formula, kind of doing it over and over and over again. And suddenly... You and the formula become one thing. And then your identity shifts. And then Christian Bush is no longer Christian Bush. I'm Sugarland and Christian Bush. So what happens when the you that you are suddenly disappears? If you hadn't Googled me yet, very possible. Or you missed that weird version of Oprah. My last name is Bush. I'm actually from the Bush Baked Beans family. And until I was 12 years old, I had one identity. I was going to grow up and run a cannery. <laughs> right? I mean, not a bad job. I'm sure it pays really well. <laughs> but weirdly, my grandparents made a strange deal and lost the whole company. And it's a different story for a different time, but they were bitter for the rest of their lives. For me, I was a kid. I didn't know anything. I didn't really care. Kids are resilient, right? So I got to be whatever I wanted to be suddenly. I decided I'm going to be a musician. Well, 1994 happens. I have a folk rock band out of Atlanta, Georgia, called Billy Pilgrim, and we got signed to Atlantic Records in New York. It was awesome. <laughs> For a kid that was supposed to run a cannery, this was the best thing ever. And it was unlikely and impossible. So I did everything I could to make that the best opportunity. I wrote the best songs. I tried to produce them the best way I could. I learned to perform. It was awesome. And then we had some friends who actually got signed to Atlantic Records like three months after we did. They were from the same part of the country we were from. They played the same kind of music. They probably used the same equation to get there, right? We both put out records the next year. They sold 16 million records. We sold 20,000. That was rough. I couldn't understand. We were kind of signed a little bit before they were. We were the critics' favorite. And as much as I was so excited for my friends in Hootie and the Blowfish to take over the world, <laughs> I was really concerned. Why wasn't it enough? And you're shaking your head in the front row. You're like, yeah, but you're a Christian. You're in Sugar Lane. It worked, dude. Right. You had the record. Mm -hmm. One. <laughs> but I would, I would challenge you this. If I made it, how many of you guys looked down the TEDx list and you got to Christian Bush and you were like, who? And your friend was like, you know, Sugarland. Sugarland, man. I love Jennifer Nettles. <laughs> I 
It's okay. I get it. I love her too. The lifeblood of Billy Pilgrim was a radio format called Adult Album Alternative, or AAA. And the number of stations that played that format started to shrink and shrink and shrink. And I could see the end coming. So I had to make a decision. Do I want to flame out as a folk rocker? Or am I going to pivot? And I knew the equation. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I was good at making music. And I knew what the drive was, and I had just seen what you could do if you got it right. So I did the next logical thing. I started a band, Sugarland. Now, not everybody just starts a band and it works. Of course, you have no idea if it's going to work, but I knew the math was right. I knew that I could pull this off if I used this same equation, right? So the music business is a very strange place. It works at glacial speed. And country radio is even slower. So when you're listening to songs on country radio right now, they're typically about, I don't know, three years since they've been written. And the first song Sugarland ever had was a song called Baby Girl. And people come up to me still. I mean, they might even today and say, that is my song. That song is my song with my dad, or that's my song with my daughter, or... or Whatever. And that song is 15 years old today. That song is a frickin' junior in high school. <laughs> so, Baby Girl tells the story of a girl who wants to pay her parents back for all the money that she borrowed chasing a dream. But what you might not know about that song is that when we wrote it, nobody had bought a single Sugarland record. Nobody, nobody had seen us play. And when we wrote it, things were bad. They were worse than bad. They were terrible. Billy Pilgrim was failing. Um, they had just flown the planes into the buildings. My mother had just died. It was awful. So when you sit down to write a song, you look out the window and if we'd have written that song, that was dark. So we decided, what if we wrote a song about the picture we hoped we'd see, right? Baby Girl did for us what nothing else could have done. And while we're, we're in that darkness, we realized that we could Write songs kind of like wishes. We could put them in bottles and throw them out into the distance and maybe they'd come back. And I, I think that's how people attach to that song because it's full of so much faith and hope. And when your dreams become the listener's dreams, it kind of circles and it cycles together and it creates something really magical. So that song that year ended up being the longest charting country song in history to date. And <laughs> thank you. And Sugarland went on to sell right, 14, 15 million records. And it was because I was doing the thing I knew I was supposed to do. I was writing songs, I was producing them, and we were performing them. Two plus two was four. In 2012, Sugarland took an indefinite hiatus. And I was faced with the real opportunity, if I wanted to keep going, to be a solo artist on country music radio. I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I know these guys. They've been playing my music for 10 years. So I put my guitar on, and I got my stuff, and I walked into the radio station, and as I was walking in, I could kind of see them, you know? <laughs> They're looking at me like, yeah, man, I know you. Come on in. And as I got closer, I realized they were terrified because they didn't really know what I sounded like when I sang. And I thought, how could this be happening? How could this be true that I could be this successful? 
And these people know so little about me. How is it that in 1994, I wanted this so bad? And in 2004, I succeeded. And in 2014, these people are looking at me like I'm an alien. And in that moment, I knew that the momentum of Sugarland was not going to transfer to Christian Bush. And I thought about that. I thought about when the job I was literally born to do disappeared. I changed, I iterated, I, I turned into a musician. And when the band that I started, that we finally got a record deal and I could see the road running out, I had to change again to be a country musician. It, I kept thinking about what it was like to be a musician all these years and everybody say, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no. And I realized I was missing an essential variable in the equation, resilience. Resilience what was the one factor that helped me get through my grandparents' crazy look at the world and the bitterness that they had. And resilience is what, every day I woke up as a musician, I was like, I want to do that, and someone said no, and that's how I got through that. And at the end of my folk rock career, resilience is what pointed me to another one. So I counsel and I mentor and I produce new artists a lot now. And they ask me almost the same thing every time. Christian, how do you deal with failure? And I was like, oh, why are you asking me that question? <laughs> You're a musician. You know how to fail. You fail every day. You're awesome at failing. You're asking me the wrong question. How do you succeed? I said, well, that's... That's the real thing you got to worry about. What happens when you succeed? Well, this is what happens. You, you look at the equation and you go, oh, wait a minute. What did I just do that helped me succeed? Oh, I did this and that. And so I go back and I do this and that again because I want to succeed. And then I do it over and over. And, and then I get obsessed at being the best this and that ever on the planet. And then my identity freezes. And then when change comes, because it always comes, they have no idea what to do. So, now I'm a solo country artist, right? Change has come. <laughs> and I'm the most unlikely solo country singer man on earth. Right? I have a raspy voice. I, I, I don't have a big range. And, but I was unwilling to admit I didn't have the right variables to pull this off. So I thought, wow, what am I going to do? Well, I'll write songs that I can sing. Which, weirdly, are also songs that you can sing. <laughs> so I sat down started writing these songs, and I, I came across the craziest, funniest Southernism I'd ever heard. And there's a lot of good ones, but this one was great. I've never seen a hearse with a trailer hitch. <laughs> and I thought, man, that's funny. <laughs> I gotta write that song. <laughs> and I did. And it was my first single as a solo act and it got released to country radio. And it started going up the charts. And now, they welcomed out onto stage the new artist, Christian Bush. <laughs> I played every new artist show on the planet. I've been a recording artist for 23 years. The song ended up in the top 20 of country billboard charts. It surprised me and everyone else. <laughs> so, 
in this moment, my friends would call me and they'd be like, man, what are you doing? And I could tell very quickly whether they really knew or not what I was doing. Some of them would say, man, that song is awesome. Some of them would be like, have you heard this new song? I'm like, that's me. I started to get a kick out of all these people who couldn't understand that I was doing all these different things. Well, I got a phone call from a playwright named Jenny Schaefer, and she was writing a play about country music in the 1950s and needed someone to write one song for her play, and so she called a country music songwriter. And I'm from a small town in East Tennessee, I know nothing about 1950s country music. I could tell you every song on every Clash record ever. <laughs> I decided, well, I don't really have the variables that I need to succeed in this, but what the hell? Why not? Why not try? So I did, and one song turned into 16, and we wrote the musical Troubadour. So then people start coming up to me and going, man, so when's your next play coming out? I was like, oh my God, I am not that guy. I'm not a playwright. But suddenly I was. And by letting go of the burden of thinking that I have a singular identity and by accepting that resilience was so integral to my equation to succeed, I was able to make another version of myself. A version of me that also writes musicals. Not everybody's gonna be in a band like Sugarland and write musicals or own a baked bean company. <laughs> Your story is likely gonna be different. But everyone has the ability to move past what they can even imagine. Move past their limitations. And the first step in that is realizing that your life is not going to work out the way you think it is. Understand that in your head, whatever you see is the end, it's never going to happen. The second part, and this is the essential part, is... When you hear no, when you fail, when your entire identity is in shatters and just kind of laying at your feet, don't look back. Don't do the math. Use resilience as the song that you stick in a bottle and cast out into the ocean. And understand that one day, it's going to come back. Maybe years later. And when it does, know that you will not be the same you that you were. Not anymore. And that's okay. And tell that new version of yourself that the guy in Sugarland told you so.